Friends, welcome to the Department of Medicine uh, Academic Talks. So we are very thankful and grateful to Dr. Alok Srivastava. He has been our teacher and mentor for more than 20 to 30 years to most of the faculty in medicine. He is a former head and he's a professor of hematology and the former head of the Department of Hematology. He's also the head of the Stem Cell Research Unit in CMC, which is a part of InSTEM in Bangalore. Um, he has pioneered the stem cell research in India, and they have frequent workshops and uh, meetings on stem cell and, in, and, and the research being done here in India. Uh, for physicians, we often think of stem cell only for bone marrow transplant, but there is so much more to stem cell, and Sir is the apt person to teach us about stem cell research and uh, what's the current state of it. And uh, so with those few words, I want to thank you again very much for accepting our invitation. And I'll hand over to you, sir. Thank you very much again, sir. Thank you, Dr. Tambu. And good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me and see the slides. Yes, sir. OK, thanks. So uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity. Actually, you know, uh, we've been thinking for quite some time uh, to do uh, what used to be the Saturday morning sessions, right? Uh, quality rounds. So, uh, quality circles, uh, yes. Quality circles, quality circles. Because there's just so much happening there. And what I'll present to you today is uh, just a flavor of what's going on at the Center for Stem Cell Research. But uh, being from hematology, I thought I will start with... Uh, you know, how stem cells have evolved in, in science and medicine. So uh, this is a picture that some of you may be familiar with of this uh, Greek mythological character Prometheus, whose crime was to steal fire from the gods and give it to humans. And he was punished by being tied to a mountain and then the vulture will come and eat part of his liver every day and the liver will grow back and he didn't die. So the concept of organ regeneration is as old as that, but we will jump rapidly to the 20th century where we have more definite evidence of the existence of some kind of a progenitor cell or a stem cell. So Jacobson and, 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 and group did this very simple experiment in 1951, they published in Science, where they irradiated the mouse and the mouse died, and then they sheened it one leg of the mouse and the mouse didn't die. Then what they did was to irritate the full mouse and actually take splenic cells and infuse them. And then they found that these mice could reconstitute their hematopoietic system. So that's how the concept of a progenitor cell came. The stem cell, the hematopoietic stem cell at that time was a hypothetical entity because nobody had found a way to identify the hematopoietic stem cell, which happened almost 30 years later when the CD34 cell, um, CD34 antigen was identified by Kurt Sivin at uh, Johns Hopkins. Now, based on that understanding and just the morphological assessment of the bone marrow, people came up with this hypothetical model on the left which said that there is the hematopoietic stem cell which divides into the myeloid lymphoid lineage and then you get all the mature cells. Now that was the concept till 2015. And you see how fallacious things can be when you don't have the right tools to study even physiology. So based on single cell analysis, basically of barcoded uh, DNA arrangements for lineage commitment, and RNA studies, expression studies to show which lineage they are committing to, we now realize that there isn't truly this so-called hypothetical uh, common myeloid and common lymphoid stages. And actually these commitments happen much earlier. And of course the mature cells are as we knew them. So even the understanding of how the hematopoietic stem cells differentiate was not complete, or even now there may be you know, nuances that are not fully understood till 2015 when this model changed to the one on the right. Now, in terms of transplantation, you know, I didn't put that slide in, but what triggered this research was the, the atomic bombing of Japan. What the Americans realized is that if you bomb somebody 
then the people who die of burns within the immediate vicinity is one part of the damage. But for a fairly large distance, people who'd never got burned got enough radiation injury to destroy their bone marrow. And then the only way to recover that is to do a transplant. So, you know, I don't think it is coincidence that transplantation research started very soon, early in the 1950s, because if this was done to somebody, then of course it can be done back to you and you will need to have a solution for it. So it started off with mouse and dog experiments. Uh, you know, the, the pioneer in this field was E. Donald Thomas working with his colleague, Rainer Staub, initially in New York, and then they moved to Seattle. And that is where you see for almost 25, 30 years, minimum amounts of transplant happening. One of the major limitations in the field was that we, in, in the early 50s and 60s, we didn't know anything about tissue compatibility because HLA was discovered only in the late 60s at the Hospital St. Louis in, in Paris. So till then, imagine they were doing transplants without even knowing HLA, with all good intentions, right? So that's why things were not good. The results were not so good. And, uh, you know, we, they obviously didn't succeed. So it was only from the early to mid 70s and from the 80s that this really started in a major way around the world, okay? Now, of course, the first 1 million transplants took how much? 43 plus 13, 56 years, right? And then the next half a million took less than 10 years. So in 2013, 1 million transplants were completed. Uh, e. Donald Thomas was given the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology in um, 1990. And then, you know, he passed away in, in 2013 and there was a special uh, session at the meeting to recognize his contribution to this field. Now in India, what you find is that we now have about 105 centers functioning. It started in 1983 from Mumbai and then we started in 1986. And then by 1993, we had only three centers and you can see as the economy and training have evolved in the country, we now have 105 centers. We know this fairly accurately because the registry for stem cell transplantation is maintained uh, at uh, CMC and we've been doing that from 2003. Now, this is the, you know, these are the numbers. So starting 1983 in the country, we do about 2,500 transplants per year in the country now. You can imagine that this is extremely low. We need uh, maybe 10 times this number for the population that we have. China has expanded very rapidly in the last five years. They now do about nine to 10,000 transplants per year. So uh, you, can, you can see that you know, the need here is still very high. And what this is showing you is about, about 1,500 allergenic transplants and about 1,000 autologous transplants. These are the indications for which these transplants are done. So this is a combination of both autologous and allogenic. And you can see that myeloma and the lymphoma is predominant in the autologous. And all the other indications are mostly phallogenic. There is a significant contribution of solid tumors in the pediatric age group with neuroblastoma and Ewing sarcoma uh, being some of the indications. On the allogenic side, it is acute leukemia, AML and ALL, uh, not so much CML anymore and bone marrow failure syndrome, such as bone marrow aplasia and myelodysplasia. And then of course, genetic disorders and in India, thalassemia. These are the major indications for the allogenic transplant. Now, uh, this just shows you how the number of centers shown in red are increasing over the years. And with that, the total number of transplants in the, in the country. Now, in the, till about 2010, we would do mostly sibling donor or related donor transplants because the chance of finding an HLA match outside of the family is extremely low. And then two things started happening. One, matched unrelated donor registry started initiating in India. And through the matched unrelated donor, people from the general population started volunteering to donate stem cells or bone marrow for somebody who needs a transplant. 
because apart from the difficulty they undergo giving the stem cells and you know that's not too much because nowadays it's peripheral blood mobilization using gcsf so uh, that number started increasing and we were able to get matched unrelated donors from indian registries we are also able to get matched unrelated donors from overseas registries mainly germany and the us and the other thing that happened is that you know a completely new biology of transplantation was established where you could take people who are half matched so everybody has a half matched parent and all parents will have a half matched child because we inherit one haplotype of the hla from each parent so now suddenly you have a situation where earlier we used to say only a third of the patients who need allogeneic transplants have a donor while now you have everybody having a donor and so these haplotransplants are increasing quite rapidly in the world and we also are doing many more and i'll show you some of the numbers so that was the story for india this is the story for cmc velo so our program started in 1986 you can see very few transplants per year in the beginning Uh, from 1992 at least one a month and then slowly starting there was a time when we were doing more than 50% of the transplant in the country but of course you know now the number of centers have increased and we now still do the largest number in the country around 275 to 300 this is likely to increase exponentially when we move to the new campus because we now have an 18 bed unit and in the new campus we'll have a 30 bed unit so this may go to i don't know 350 400 something like that per year that will be one of the larger numbers in the world for a single center to be doing those transplants last year of course was a different story and so the numbers came down because of the pandemic now the distribution of these transplants you can see that till about 2007 we did only related donor transplants shown in the red bars now after that we started what is called the the alternative donor transplants mud matched unrelated donor and haplo as i explained earlier half matched relatives so you can see that now the haplo is actually becoming more and we are almost uh, you know 40 50% of our transplants are the alternative donors so this is a big change big change because now many more patients can benefit from this treatment also the social structure where not only self payment which is still the predominant way this uh, treatment is paid for but a good number of patients are getting employer benefits they have insurance or they have other you know healthcare benefits uh, that uh, allow for this kind of treatment to be undertaken which is extremely expensive but the good thing is that under corporate social responsibility there are public sector units that are supporting transplants and so we are able to transplant many uh, you know people who are not at all capable of affording this themselves through these subsidies of course again in our center also last year there was a major dip because of the pandemic and that's the data shown here so so much for hematology now i showed you that just to say that you know the bone marrow was the easiest easiest organ to study and aspirate and therefore identify its cells and from there we could figure out the progenitor cell the hematopoietic stem cell but that concept of a progenitor cell a stem cell giving rise to the cells in any tissue or organ apply to all organs in the body and what this very busy slide is trying to show you that it doesn't matter whether an organ is of endodermal ectodermal or mesodermal origin you have a stem cell in every organ and now there is plenty of research going on where people are trying to identify those stem cells in the same way that we could easily take you know bone marrow aspirate and look for the stem cell there and then you know manipulate it to study physiology or to for many other applications which i'll come to so that is stem cell research basically trying to identify the progenitor cells and using them to understand physiology to create disease models or to treat all three but of course you know the most accessible as i said earlier have been the hematopoietic stem cells and the mesenchymal stromal cells which are essentially stromal cells in all organs uh, if you take uh, bone marrow and grow it without any culture medium in what is called plastic adherent 
culture plates then the cell that grows in the, in the, under those conditions are the mesenchymal stromal cells they are very similar to fibroblasts in their morphology and even in some of their biological characteristics and they are present in all the tissues almost you can extract mesenchymal stromal cells from just about every tissue and they have been used also a lot in clinical applications so what makes you know a particular stem cell uh, or its uh, you know research or therapy possible so as i said earlier easy to access so you know hematologists and maybe a few other specialties uh, orthopedics people were aspirating bone marrow and for decades and nobody was using them to treat stroke or myocardial infarction or cirrhosis or uh, you know degenerative disorders but the moment the stem cell concept came about two decades ago this use and abuse became rampant and we will mention that very briefly then if you take bone marrow you know because it's a liquid organ through a suitable marker using various kind of isolation techniques either flow cytometric or magnet based you can isolate these stem cells and then you can use them for therapy or you know other applications so you then have those cells available also for transplantation unfortunately that is not so easy with almost all other organs which are solid organs because to get to those few cells within the solid structure is a physical challenge and that's where you know some of the research still is in how to get those cells out in enough numbers to able to be able to do the kind of cellular transplantation that hematology has been able to implement so that really is the reason why some of these applications are much more advanced in hematology uh, and places where you can use mesenchymal stromal cells i'll come back to that orthopedics being one of them because these mesenchymal stromal cells have a natural prediction to differentiate into cartilage or bone okay so so much for adult stem cells now everybody who read embryology knows how from a uh, fertilized ovum to a blastocyst uh, to the full organism in this case the human uh, fetus right now everybody knew this and they knew that there were embryonic stem cells from which all this happened but nobody had developed a technique to actually isolate and manipulate these embryonic stem cells and this is what jimmy thompson did in 1998 this uh, it was published again in science and what he did was to take cells from the blastocyst and he could then grow them in a culture environment and now you have embryonic stem cells available to you to culture and then depending on the culture conditions that you give you could generate just about any endodermal ectodermal or mesodermal tissue now this was very powerful because now you could take embryonic stem cells and actually try to generate various tissues and then you could transplant there was only one problem one big problem what was that these were not your own embryonic stem cells these were somebody else's embryonic stem cells and therefore they will have a different hla and there will be problems of histocompatibility so how can you overcome this so a very smart orthopedic surgeon called shinya yamanaka in japan um you know did something which was truly remarkable but before that the concept of cloning animals was established by john gerden long ago uh, you know um, in the 60s 70s so john gerden had actually taken first the frog a frog egg and then from a somatic cell he removed the haploid nucleus of the frog egg and put the diploid nucleus of the somatic cell and he could get a full frog and then of course you know dolly the sheep that was cloned first uh, in in scotland and now they have cloned many animals thankfully we don't clone human beings and that's a banned research but shinya manaka what he did was that he said so they made they made an ovum into a pluripotent stem cell right so that from the ovum you could get the whole animal without you know using the sperm you got a diploid nucleus of an adult animal and you created an adult animal you cloned them now what shinya manaka did was that okay you take a somatic 
diploid stem cell, I mean, a diploid cell, a fibroblast or a lymphocyte. And now you apply certain transcription factors, which are usually active only in embryonic stem cells. And these transcription factors will make this adult stem cell behave like a embryonic stem cell. And from that, you can derive a whole animal. So that is what he did in 2006, and he called it the induced pluripotent stem cells. Nobody else in the world has got a Nobel Prize as quickly after their discovery. And in 2012, six years later, he was awarded the Nobel Prize, and now he runs uh, an orthopedic surgeon who runs a stem cell research unit uh, in, in Japan, in Kyoto. So the bottom line, as I told you, there's tremendous potential for using stem cells in three areas. You know, studying physiology or developmental biology, as they call it, or developing disease models, drug development. You can avoid certain human studies by using these organoids or just cells for testing drugs. But the, the, the interest in a hospital like ours is towards regenerating organs where drugs alone are not enough. Okay. So this is just a cartoon to say how you have a patient, you can make iPSCs from the patient, you can differentiate them into more, uh, you know, into other tissues, and then you can use them either for disease modeling or drug screening, or you can do cell therapy. And all this is actually beginning to happen in the world already. This is an, a specific example where say you want to study vascular uh, diseases and the effect of various drug therapies. So you take iPSC, you can dif differentiate them into endothelial cells, you can differentiate them into smooth muscle cells, and then you can construct 2D models or 3D models. And within these 2D or 3D models, you can then apply drugs and you can study them at the cellular level, at the tissue organ level, and you can, of course, apply different techniques, you know, based on analysis of expression, RNA, proteins, you know, whatever you want. One of the things that all of you are familiar, you know, rofecoxib was, you know, delisted, so to say, some time ago because of cardiac toxicity. And that came only after several years of use. So they went back, the companies went back and looked at whether they could have predicted from libraries of cells like this. And actually, in the way they tested it, they could have predicted that this is likely to happen. So many drug companies, it's much more expensive to do human trials than to do these kind of library screens and drop drugs if they are found to be toxic within these kind of model systems. Okay, so when you have so much potential, there is scope for abuse, right? So as I was saying, nobody else was aspirating marrow to do anything, but now suddenly, people started aspirating bone marrow and there were people in Chennai and other cities in India and the world offering people stem cell therapy for a stroke with no proof. And they were charging anywhere, anywhere from 20,000 rupees to, a, to two lakhs in Chennai almost 10 years ago, you know, and people who are desperate would go for that. So people were offering stem cell therapy for all kinds of unproven, uh, uh, unproven applications. Now, even with proven applications, when you use cells to regenerate an organ, stem cell, if you regenerate the heart, if you regenerate the liver, well, you know, it could be anybody's stem cell regenerating it. If they're tissue compatible, it's okay. But it gets a little tricky if you regenerate brain with somebody else's stem cells, even if they're compatible. What happens to that human being? You know, what are we defined by? Our looks or our thinking, our mind? It gets into an area of ethics and uh, you know some challenging situations. And the other thing, of course, is you know you can clone animals, you can clone organs. So there is already a technology where people are cloning human heart in the pig, a technology where you can clone other human organs. But certainly you don't want to clone the whole human being, and you don't want to clone the brain. So you know there are some. Uh, you know, guidelines on how stem cell research should be applied in certain specific situations. And these are the guidelines from the International Society for Stem Cell Research. Uh, some of the things that we want to, we want to educate patients, 
that they you know they are vulnerable and they are they can be exploited so some of the things that they should understand before agreeing to participate in this kind of advertised therapy which is mostly done from a financial perspective in india also the the department of biotechnology and the indian council of medical research have got together to provide the national guidelines for stem cell research which is coordinated by the national apex committee for stem cell research and therapy the problem is that these are guidelines these are not laws so the good scientist follows them the crook scientist does not follow them and it is very difficult to prosecute them in the absence of suitable laws and that is a you know not only a problem in india but it's a problem worldwide okay so based on all this about 15 years ago the department of biotechnology of the government of india decided that they wanted to create a translational research unit somewhere in the country and given the um preeminence of cmc as an institution and the department of hematology here for the kind of work they were doing with stem cell transplantation as i showed you earlier you know in a in a competitive uh, grant uh, you know application we were selected to establish this center for stem cell research this was a big deal in the institution because the institution had never allowed any agency to actually create a physical uh, you know building in in the in the campus so the space was allocated in the rehab campus and over two years the construction was completed and over from 2008 this has been functioning as the center for stem cell research so it has um, it has the research building that you see here and on the bottom left is what's the gmp unit the good manufacturing small pharmaceutical unit and i'll come back to that uh, you know later on so uh, there is there is full scope for all levels of cell and molecular biology research applied to cell therapies okay so over the last 15 years or so we've tried to develop thematic programs you know one of the things that uh, we you know we had a lot of brainstorming in the institution and also with our alumni and the plan was that we should work in teams on teams work in teams okay like microsoft teams and in on teams when you work in teams on teams then you are likely to solve some problems so here you know there are three areas that have evolved musculoskeletal regeneration uh, which is and i'll tell you a little more about the cell and gene therapy for blood diseases to begin with but you know we are only waiting for a student or faculty to get really excited and bring other um, other systems other organs into this so you know look up pubmed if you find something is happening anywhere in the world and if you are interested there is opportunity to initiate it here all the support will be provided and then we have you know developed so so ccr was the first place in the country to develop human induced pluripotent stem cells in 2011 uh, so that's how you know that work started there and now we have some applications going on with that technology so what i'll do now is to tell you a little bit about what's going on in these different areas so the musculoskeletal regeneration is led by our pediatric orthopedic surgeon rusha madhuri and uh, you know she has collaborations in various departments as you see here in different uh, you know units of the orthopedics department general surgery urology gynecology pediatric surgery and uh, you know uh, yeah general surgery again from a different and they're looking at not only bone and cartilage but they're also looking at smooth muscle as well as skeletal muscle so you can see the applications listed here and uh, you know this is a very major program which also has international collaboration and if you want to learn more about it you know uh, call risha and i'm sure she will do a lecture for you on their whole program which is about uh, bone and cartilage as well as smooth and skeletal muscle regeneration and uh, they also use a lot of animal models uh, both small animal models that we do at the ccr in the rodents but they also use farm animals uh, both rabbits and goats and you know cmc has a farm animal uh, yeah, um, set up where they do those studies as well now the gene and cell therapy so this is something that is again fairly unique at the center for stem cell research in the country there is no other place doing anything in this kind of scale towards treatment of genetic disorders so what do we mean by cell and gene therapy what we mean is you know using either dna or rna for treatment cure or prevention of disease so including the mrna vaccine is actually a kind of gene therapy okay 
So you can use viral vectors or you can use non-viral vectors. And the mRNA vaccine is actually using a non-viral vector, a liposome, right? The, uh, the Moderna vaccine that you have for COVID-19. So in gene therapy, you have two, two options. One is basically you have a defective gene that you want to correct. So you can either repair it and I'll come back to repair later, but you can replace it. So you have, you synthesize a, a transgene, which is a normally function gene, functioning gene with all the introns and exons that are necessary for its function, a suitable promoter and enhancer, and then you have a functional gene. The only problem is how do you transport it to the tissue of interest? And the vehicle that transports it to the tissue of interest is the vector. And the vector can be a viral vector and you know it can be an integrating virus like the lentivirus or it can be a non-integrating virus like the adeno-associated virus. So in the most advanced gene therapies going on in the world in terms of clinical trials now, in hemophilia, it is mostly direct delivery where the transgene is packaged into AAV, adeno-associated viral vector and infused in a peripheral vein this viral vector has a tropism for the liver. So it takes the transgene to the liver, transduces the hepatocytes and starts producing protein. Now for immune deficiency disorders and thalassemia sickle cell disease, the approach is a little different. You use an integrating vector, in this case, a lentiviral vector. So derived from the HIV lineage, right? But of course, uh, you know, degutted completely with all its, uh, you know, replication genes. And then you package instead the transgene of your interest and then you take stem cells from the patient, transduce the stem cells ex vivo okay, in a culture system. And then you have gene corrected these stem cells now and you use that to do the transplant. So that is what gene therapy is. So, you know, I told you about the mRNA vector. Sujan Marapalli is working on this. So we are fairly advanced with the preclinical trials. He has injected the mouse already. He's able to see some antibodies. And we are getting inquiries from companies that may want to actually take this forward in terms of commercial production and clinical trials. So this is a DBT grant on which uh, Surjan Marupalli at the Center for Stem Cell Research has been working for the last uh, eight, nine months to try and develop an mRNA-based vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. Now, I'll show you in just uh, one slide each, you know, the work that various people are doing. Saravana Bhavan Tangavel is, uh, is a scientist also working on cell and gene therapy, he has several areas of interest. So what you see in the first three are, are developing gene therapy by gene editing. So he uses the CRISPR-Cas9 system for editing the defect in the beta globin that is causing thalassemia or sickle cell disease. And he has advanced a lot in terms of completing animal studies in showing the efficacy of these gene corrected hematopoietic stem cells human hematopoietic stem cells for treating thalassemia and sickle cell disease. But he also has one at least, uh, you know, very cool uh, experiment uh, project going on. And that is towards editing the hematopoietic stem cell progenitor cells for HIV therapy. He's collaborating with the Department of Virology and the Infectious Disease Department here. You know that CCR5 is the receptor for the HIV. And if you can gene edit the, the CCR5 gene so that the receptor gets altered, then that T cell is no longer uh, infected by the HIV. So all we need to do is to take hematopoietic stem cells from HIV positive patients, do the gene editing, and then transplant the same autologous hematopoietic stem cell back. And this approach has already been shown in the literature to be effective in controlling HIV infection. So this is something that's very interesting that's going on and is soon likely to reach a stage where it may be able to go to a clinical trial. Now, Mohan Kumar Murugesan is another scientist who is working in a different uh, part of the beta globin gene, uh, as well as the gamma globin gene, one to try and correct the beta globin gene function and the other to enhance hemoglobin F production. So we have a major program dealing with thalassemia and sickle cell disease because that is a public health problem in the country affecting millions of people. Uh, so, you know, that is something that we want to develop gene therapy for. Now, he's also working on the genome editing approach to hemophilia A. Uh, for those of you who want to learn more about this, unlike CRISPR-Cas9, he's using what's called a base editing approach. And you know, that is a, a lot more specific with less off-target effects. And that is something that Mohan Kumar is working on.
Now, if you think of the strategies for gene therapy for thalassemia sickle cell disease, you can do gene correction. You can, you know, off the defective beta globin gene, you can do correction in the hemoglobin F in the gamma globin gene. Now, you know, we are all born with almost 100% hemoglobin F. And by about six to nine months of age, this hemoglobin F has come down to adult levels of less than 1% usually. And you have then developed the adult hemoglobin and a little bit of A2 hemoglobin. Now, why did this gene have to go to sleep in everybody? It's all right if you have a good functional adult hemoglobin, beta globin gene, which will then combine with the alpha and give you most of the adult hemoglobin, that's fine. But if by chance your beta globin gene is defective, if only we could keep the gamma globin gene active, so there is a transcription factor called BCL11A, which uh, you know, comes on to shut down the gamma globin gene. Now, if we could keep that transcription factor down, if you somehow disrupt, disrupt the BCL11A transcription factor, then your hemoglobin F will start producing again and you could cure thalassemia and sickle cell disease through that way. So in fact, some of these concepts have actually gone to the clinic. And this is a, a study that was published just uh, earlier this year the first case of actually trying to shut down BCL11A by a lentiviral SHRNA based uh, mechanism. This is coordinated from the Boston Children's Hospital and they have shown success in the first few patients by shutting down BCL11A. Mohan is working on, excuse me, doing that by gene editing rather than by, uh, by SHRNA. But we also have the same SHRNA approach uh, with the lenti, which Dr. Shaji has been working on. So we have developed our own lentiviral vector with SHRNA, which is completing mouse studies. And based on that, there is no other model really to go forward. We would be looking at production of the vector and, and initiating clinical trials in this area as well. The other area, as I told you, is the gene editing. And this is what was done. And this was also published in January this year gene-edited hematopoietic stem cells for treating uh, thalassemia and sickle cell disease, very similar approach, you know, very similar concept of enhancing hemoglobin F production. Uh, and this was reported from CRISPR Therapeutics in, uh, in January this year. So both these approaches are reaching advanced stages of preclinical validation at the Center for Stem Cell Research, and they will you know, likely to go to trial in the next one to two years. And this work is done, as I showed you earlier, by Mohan Kumar Murgeshan and Sarvana Bhavan. They'll be very happy to talk to anybody who wants to be uh, you know, involved in this kind of work. Okay, so overall, um, as I said, you can, for hemoglobin disorders, you have a patient who has a defective beta globin gene. You can take the stem cells and then you purify the stem cells. And then you do gene correction, either by viral vector adding a gene or suppressing the BCL11A, or you can do gene, gene editing using one of the gene editing tools, the zinc, and the zinc finger nuclease, Talon, or CRISPR. And we are using CRISPR here, as well as base editing as two ways of gene editing. And then you can give these uh, cells back to the patient as an autologous transplant. Okay, uh, let me now talk about uh, a clinical trial that has just been approved for us. So in hemophilia, in the world, it is mostly the AAV-based trials that are going on. Almost 20 trials are going on. We are also developing an AAV-based trial. We should have gone to the clinic two years ago, but we had difficulties getting the clinical vector produced in the US. There is no technology in, in India at the moment. And therefore, that got delayed. So in the meantime, we developed in collaboration with Emory University an approach to gene therapy for, uh, for hemophilia using the hematopoietic stem cell where the lentiviral vector will carry the factor VIII gene and it will produce factor VIII in monocytic lineage cells. So this has been validated in two animal models and we have shown enough production of factor VIII uh, in the hemophilic mouse, as well as what is called the NSG mouse, an immunocompromised mouse, where you can put the human hematopoietic stem cell. And both based on this, we had filed a new drug application uh, in 2018 in India. Uh, in the US, they filed in 2019, and there the review process is much more streamlined. Within a month, you are supposed to say yes or no, and they got their approval. It took us almost three years to get the approval for this investigational drug product, which is this transgene with the factor eight in a lentiviral vector backbone. And this product is already ready. And we've done the preclinical studies in trying to show that we can 
transduce hematopoietic stem cells from hemophilic patients. With suitable IRB approval, we took uh, stem cells from three hemophilic patients, first time in the world, and they were transduced. The data was submitted to the regulators. And based on that, we now have approval for a phase one clinical trial. And that should really start in the next, uh, I don't know, one to three months. We are just waiting to import the, the clinical grade vector, which should happen within this month. And after that, uh, you know, we are ready to actually, we have already counseled some patients. We need to go through the motions of doing the clinical trial as shown here. So you collect the stem cells from the patient, you do the transduction, which we have already established the methods at the Center for Stem Cell Research, and then we'll do the transplantation in the Department of Hematology, just like we do autologous transplants for so many other diseases. But the big thing is doing the, the part on the right, these are, this is the technology that has been now established at the Center for Stem Cell Research in terms of taking these stem cells, transducing them with the vector, ensuring that there is enough vector copy number and that the cells are still viable and suitable for autologous transplant. So that's what will be done. We are also developing an AV way, so an adeno-associated viral vector for hemophilia gene therapy. And this is also fairly advanced, waiting for clinical production of the vector. This has been tested in, in the mouse model and beyond that, it really goes into human beings. So as soon as you know that vector production, the technology for that is being established again at the Center for Stem, Re Stem Cell Research. Sometime next, middle of next year, we hope that to be ready. And second half of next year, there's a possibility that we could be initiating this gene therapy clinical trial as well. The haplobanking banking is a very interesting concept. You know, human beings may be homozygous for HLA haplotypes. And that is fairly common in Southern India, given the consanguinity. So if you take stem cell, if you take peripheral blood cells, lymphocytes from such donors and use them to make induced pluripotent stem cells, now you have super donors. And people have calculated that if you have a certain number of such induced pluripotent stem cells, you can use that bank to generate tissues for organ regeneration for a large proportion of the population. In the US, the calculation is that about 900 to 1,000 of these haplo uh, haploidentical induced pluripotent stem cell bank will cover 80 to 90 percent of the population. That number may be much larger here given the heterogeneity in India, but the concept is the same. So we have started creating this haplobank uh, in India as part of an international consortium and the, it's through the Department of Biotechnology and this is done at the Center for Stem Cell Research and Dr. Dolly from the Transfusion Medicine Department along with Dr. Shaji are the people who lead that work. So I wanted to just show you this floor plan of the GMP building. I showed you the GMP building in the beginning. This was a 6,000 square foot GMP building that was created. The anterior part has four modules for making these products. We had left the posterior part empty for you know, doing gene therapy, uh, gene modifications. And that is what we have completed in the last six months or so. And now we have, uh, you know, this extension has been added, the one you see on the right. And then at the back of this is where the, the vector production and the, the cell transduction will happen for the gene therapy clinical trials. So with that, I just want to acknowledge our collaborators and of course funding from the Department of Biotechnology. But most importantly, I want to show you this, that you know, all aspects of this kind of research are possible to do at the Center for Stem Cell Research. You, know, you are all invited at any phase of interest that you may have in any of these areas within the fields of your interest, not necessarily hematology at all in any specialty that you are interested in and any you know, faculty who is listening to this today, you're most welcome to join uh, in this. Uh, in this uh, and you know, we are actually very well funded. This is just a list of almost 18 departments that have worked at the Center for Stem Cell Research and the faculty who have worked there in the past, in the last 12, 13 years. And so it is open to anybody. You can, if you have an idea, you think about it, uh, there is enough in internal funding available apart from what the fluid research grants are because we've been fortunate to actually have very generous funding. Uh, we have received almost 100 crores over the last 15 years in core funding and we have generated competitive grants of another 100 crores uh, in the last 15 years. So almost 200 crores of grants have uh, you know, helped do what we're doing there and everybody is invited. With that, I'll stop and if you have any comments or questions, I'll be glad to discuss with you. Thank you. So, wow, that was fantastic. I think the total eye opener for all of us, because uh, 
I, I didn't know. I was thinking it's only mostly hematology based stem cell. But I had. No, Tambu, it's for everybody. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I, know, I, I, that I, was I, the main point. You know, Dr. Ban, he came here as DBT secretary in 2005 6. He met the senators three times. And, you know, the owner of this project is the director CMC, not the faculty. You know, this is a collaboration between the institute and everybody else. It is not a faculty owned project. It is an institute owned project. So I had some few questions, sir. One is uh, the people initially thought like for like spinal cord injuries, stem cell may be miraculous or for type one diabetics or pancreatic stem cells. Are, are those really far away? Like from being, because I'm a medical, from general medicine, those are yeah, so you know, that is where uh, there's a lot of disappointment because if you take spinal cord injury, so people have tried all kinds of progenitor cells. The easiest one, of course, were the mesenchymal stromal cells as well as uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells. And even here, you know, we have done several studies where Dr. Tarian and Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Tarian from PMR and Sanjay Kumar from CSCR have done some very interesting uh, rodent studies where they could show benefit, but you know, it didn't, it has gone beyond that to clinical trials in the world and didn't really uh, work out that well. So there is no approved product at the moment for any of those applications. Then people have used um, nasal, um, endothelial, no, nasal stem, you know, the, the part which is very close to the brain right in the top, I forget the name now. Okay, those cells also for this transplant in pluripotent stem, induced pluripotent stem cell derived products for these transplants. So these models have not worked. Where stem cell therapy has worked reasonably well and there are products are chronic limb ischemia. Okay, so that there are approved products, even in India, Stemputics has a product that is being used so mesenchymal stromal cells to improve uh, blood flow in chronic, you know, limb ischemia is one area where there is stem cell product. Skin problems, uh, there are some stem cell products. Ocular diseases, corneal diseases, there are some stem cell products. But otherwise, and then in the bone and cartilage area, okay, there are stem cell products. But uh, in many other areas, there are, you know, all kinds of research possible. And what is, uh, you know, um, really needed is, you know, more departments from CMC, all the sub branches of medicine, all the subspecialties, you know, to actually think about and all the medical graduates within the postgraduates to think about that. Just look at the literature and say, whichever organ you are interested in and say that organ and stem cells, what's happening in the world. If something is happening in the world, it's possible to do here. All the infrastructure is available. Yeah, the, the, from my side, the last question was after COVID, everybody was talking about lung transplant. Is there anything about stem cells in, for doing for fibrotic so, lung disease? Yeah, so, you know, absolutely. Uh, you know, there's mesenchymal stromal cells. One good thing. So the other indication in the world where mesenchymal stromal cells have been approved in a few countries is chronic graft versus host disease. So the mesenchymal stromal cells definitely have an immune regulatory uh, property. And uh, several clinical trials have been done in the world for COVID-related inflammation reduction in severely uh, ill patients with COVID infection with mesenchymal stromal cells. The results are equivocal, okay? There are some publications showing clear advantage. Others have been equivocal. It is difficult to design these trials. Uh, you know, we can now do in a much more organized way as a planned clinical trial rather than you know, there was a proposal when this uh, when this problem started of uh, compassionate use, and I don't think that went through because it wasn't judged to be scientific enough. But there is there are studies now showing benefit and others which are not uh, so. We have products available. We have mesenchymal stem cells stored as a phase one clinical trial because we still have people dying with pneumonia from this, you know. And um, if it's done as a phase one clinical trial, it is some, something that's possible. Thank you, sir. Is there any suggestions, comments from other people?
uh, uh, sorry to ask, um, like our basically knowledge about this uh, CRISPR gene editing and the stem cell therapy is very minimal. Uh, so would, is there a small course or any reading material which you would recommend, sir? Reading from which I... No, why actually, can... actually I can see Dr. Mohan Kumar is on the line and he is one of the scientists who is... Uh, his part, he, he, he's committed to training and teaching people, you know. So, uh, so Dr. Mohan Kumar and Dr. Saruna Bhavan, and if you just, if, if Tambu sends me a note, we'll organize a, 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 a class or a lecture like this or whatever, one or two, depending on your level of interest. In fact, I've been talking to the principal that even the undergraduates should get some exposure to this and medical and pediatric and pathology postgraduates, you know could all combine because this will be relevant to, you know, medicine, pediatrics and pathology at least in what you're doing. And Dr. Mohan and Dr. Sarna Bhavan could take one lecture each. So you could have uh, uh, easily some understanding of gene editing. Uh, you know, they are among the best in the country doing this work and you only have to ask. Sure, sir. <laughs> we will we'll plan and get back to you, sir, with the dates and everything. Thank you, sir. So, Mohan, I have committed on your behalf. Sure, sir. Like, we, we can discuss over. You can put on the camera, let people see you, so that <laughs> they know who to contact. <laughs> sure, sir. That's Mohan, okay. And Saruna also is there. So, two of them, they are excellent. Okay. So, would it be, uh, is it, uh, can we come and visit the stem cell center and see the facility? Because it's like Greek and Latin to us. We are, <laughs> we are all been only in wards. But is there something to see? Or oh, these are machines where we can't actually see anything going on. Can't see anything, Tambu. It'll look like any cell or molecular biology lab. You know, lab wise, there's nothing to see at all. Um, but, you know, um, we can organize, no problem. I think the touch and feel, uh, <laughs> we can organize, you know, for uh, the, the medical postgraduates. If you want to organize a visit, why not? Because it may inspire them to come, they see the lab going on, you've got yeah, a, yeah, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, GMP yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, I don't know absolutely. whether we can see all those things. Yeah, we can organize. Just, just like that. Right? Yeah, we can organize on a, on a day that uh, you know, it works for you. Absolutely, we can. Anybody else has any questions, comments? Uh, if not, we'll be close. Sir. sir, thank you very much again. It's been fantastic. And with your permission, we'll upload this video on our YouTube channel. Uh, many people will miss it and then they'll see it later on. And I will certainly write to you and we can ask uh, Mohan and Saravala Bhavan to take the next few sessions for us. And if possible, we'll have a visit to your facilities and see you one day, sir. You're welcome, Tamu. Thank you very All much, right. sir. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Bye, okay. Bye sir.